And good evening, anyone. Congratulations, Sarah. Fingers crossed. Congratulations. I appreciate the encouragement, actually, from... Um, did your job for you. Um, I actually appreciate the, uh, the encouragement I have been from a lot of the brethren in here, and I appreciate your prayers. Um, as Pastor Sam said, actually, I do enjoy preaching. Um, two main positives to come out of it. Number one, it's great weight loss. I do at least 10,000 steps uh, before I preach. And if you ask Kathy, I, I have to go for a walk every day to just prepare for the week before. But secondly, I get to study God's Word. I'm held accountable to study God's Word. And that's been a blessing in my life um, as my family keeps growing. So if you've got your Bibles, and I hope that you do, open up to Hebrews chapter 13 this evening. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm going to read the verse. We're going to pray. We'll go from there. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord and loving Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this night and this day that you've given us, Lord. You created this day, Lord, and I pray that we may rejoice in it. I pray, Father, for your hand upon me this evening, Lord. You know my nerves, oh Lord, and you know your word. And we thank you, Father, for the truth of it. And I pray, Father, you be with those, Lord, listening, Lord God, myself also. Give me strength and give me wisdom, Lord. I pray, Father, that you be exalted. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so it seems like, you know, all the talk over the last few months has, has definitely moved away from COVID. Um, and it's become about economic concerns, financial situation and recession outlooks. You know, we as Christians aren't exempt from these type of pressures. You know, inflation continues to surge forward, petrol prices going up, food shortages, interest rates up once, twice, three times. And if you have any significant mortgage, especially relevant to the younger generation, this is going to put some significant pressure on you financially. I mean, I know people within this church, people outside of this church, Christians and non-Christians alike having to take up second jobs, cut back on spending, and change the way they live. You know, I work in an industry that gives me exposure to Australian spending habits, and we are seeing declines across all categories of spending. If you're a business owner, you're feeling the pinch, whether it be people shortages or the cost, the cost of goods rising. It's tough out there. And despite all the attempts by government and the RBA telling us that it's going to get better, it's going to get a lot worse. It's starting to take its toll on people. It's starting to take its toll on Christians too. People are having conversations about selling, moving, elsewhere, and I'd be lying if I said I hadn't considered it myself. Because you can make the arguments in your head. Less cost, more time with family. If I just move further away, if I just change jobs, if I just change the way that I tithe. See, this is what the financial pressures of this world start to do to us as Christians. So I'm here to give you some pre-financial advice. Now, I'm not a qualified financial advisor, okay? You do have to do your own research. But I have studied, and I'm going to make it really, really, really simple, okay? I'm going to show you, show you, number one, what you shouldn't do. Then I'm going to show you what you should do. And more importantly, I'm going to tell you the reason why. This is not a sales pitch. I know it sounds like that, but it's not a sales pitch. It's all facts, so in Hebrews 13, 5, there's so much to unpack here. Let me read the verse again. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, the English, to be fair, doesn't quite capture the magnitude of this verse. But before we get there, can we talk a bit about the Hebrews? We know Pastor Sam, he preached a year-long series on the book of Hebrews, and that was a blessing. And there were two main themes to come out of the book of Hebrews. 
Number one, a greater than he, a greater than he is here. Much more than is here. That's Jesus Christ. He is the greater than. He is much more than. And he's greater than any angel, priest, sacrifice, or Old Testament covenant command. And because of that, as we go on to Hebrews 11, we see examples of faith. And in Hebrews 12 and 13, we see the practicalness of faith. These Christians were drawn to their Jewish background, almost struggling to separate themselves from their Jewish religion. They were going through trials and persecutions referenced in chapter 12. They were moving away from Christian instructions, chapter 5, needing to be taught again the oracles of God. There were some stopping attendance and meetings, forsaking the assembly of themselves. And then they experienced the spoiling of their goods and great fight of afflictions. Why bring all this up? Well, let me replay that back. Number one, they are saved. Number two, they are fighting their former selves and their former, their former influences. Number three, they have forgotten Bible truths and in need of the milk of the word of God. Number four, they are struggling with church attendance. Number five, they are finding it harder to keep their goods. And then they're facing some tough trials. Now when I read that, I don't know if he's talking to the Hebrews then or the church now. And we can thank God that this is recorded for us to learn from because we need encouragement today. We need exhortation today. We need to be reminded today. Now back to my financial advice. One of the first things that you should not do is found at the start of verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Now I know some of you may read this and go, okay, so I just don't need to talk about it. Now even if that's what the verse said, I guarantee you that if you are harboring covetousness in your heart, it will definitely come out in the way that you talk. But it's not just about the way that you talk. You see, the word here, conversation, is the word tropos. You see, it's not about your talk. It's about your walk. It's about your manner of life, your character, the way that you live. Now, let me just put that there for a second. Let the way that you live be without covetousness. Now that word covetousness is the, is the Greek word aphilagos. Now the first, part of, the first part of that verse, the A, that's a negative. So think of that as no. The second part, phil, is where we get our word phileo, which is that brotherly love. You'd be, the, you'd be familiar with the term Philadelphia. And the last part, agos, in the ancient Greek refers to silver, or money. So put it together, no, love, money. Don't have an affection for money. Let your manner of life, that's your conversation, be free from the love of money. That's covetousness, as it's mentioned here. And as I'm sitting here and I'm contemplating this definition, and I'm reading, and I'm thinking, why, Lord? Why put it on money? I mean, why didn't you just keep covetousness at its general level? You see, in Hebrews 13, in verse 1, you see the practical Christian life. You see, number one, brotherly love. Show it. In verse 1, again, you see to be hospitable because you never know who you might entertain. In verse 2, you see, it says to think of those less fortunate or going through trials. Some of them were in prison. In verse 3, it says to honour your marriage. And then in verse 4, it says this. You know, and people have come up with some fancy stats, you know, when you, when you do your research and your studies. You know, and I mean, I almost laughed how they can almost make anything look like anything. So there's apparently 2,300 verses directly or indirectly related to money. 11 out of the 39 parables have to do with money. But if you've read your Bible for some time, you know that Christ uses money merely as illustrations. Why? Because we all understand it. Even the world will tell you money can't buy happiness. 
but it doesn't stop them chasing. Even, even if you told the world the love of money is the root of all evil, they won't disagree. But that doesn't stop them falling into the trap of it. And truth be told, it doesn't stop Christians either. And the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of God, puts his finger right on it. But why? I mean, why put it here? Well, I believe Christ says it best in Matthew 6, 24. He says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Understand, he says, cannot. It cannot be done. The love of money will draw you away from Christ. It will draw you away from God's will. We, as God's people, should have a desire to draw closer to him. I mean, isn't that true? When you got saved, you couldn't help but want to read your Bible. You couldn't help but want to know more about Christ. We need to be reminded. I mean, there are so many biblical examples of men and women and their love for money. We think of Lot who pitched his tent towards Sodom. We think of Naomi's husband. We were just studying that on a Friday night with the youth. All leaving because of what appeared to be greener pastures. We we see the three rich men in the New Testament. And for the sake of time, we won't turn there, but if I say this, you'll probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Sell all you have and follow me. He went away sorrowful. Build farmhouses for all his goods. Thou fool, thy soul is required of thee tonight. And the rich man in the temple, God, look at me. I'm not like this poor beggar. He ended up asking just for one drop of water on the tip of his tongue. So that's the first piece of financial advice here tonight. Let your conversation be without covetousness. So we see what we shouldn't do. Now I, want, now I want us to see, well, what should we do? I mean, it sounds easy enough, right? Next part of the verse. And be content with such things as ye have. The English word content means desiring no more than what one has. The Greek word is archaeo, which means to be satisfied. Now it goes on to say, with such things as ye have. I mean, it's an innocent statement. But in the Greek, the word is parami, which is a present participle. It means to be near or at hand. So you can say that I need to be content with what I have right now. And in the future, when it's right now, I need to be content there too. We are to be satisfied. Too often when we hear this word contentment, oh, we can fall into a trap as Christians. We can, think, we can have this attitude of, well, then I can't be ambitious. We can have this attitude of, well, I just need to suck it up and live with whatever I've got and be miserable about it. We can get into, oh, I can't make plans. I can't have nice things. I can't earn too much. I can't spend. Why? Because I need to be content. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, God's gift is that we can enjoy the fruits of our labour. Now, this word content is translated a couple of times throughout the New Testament. Twice it's known as sufficient. Twice it's known as enough. Once, suffice. So before you sit there and you plan your next move, pick up and leave, change jobs, decide what the next investment is, question whether you should tithe or not, ask yourself, why am I doing this? Is what I have sufficient? Is what I have enough? Listen, just because it's inconvenient, it does not mean that it's insufficient. The world says that we need to be comfortable. The world says accumulate more and more. The Bible says we need to be content with what God has provided for us. Now, I'm not expecting you nor I to walk out those doors and be content overnight. It's a process. In Philippians, in Philippians 4, in verse 11, a verse that I'm sure you could all quote quite easily. The Apostle Paul writes, For I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, herewith to be content. 
Notice the word learned. Now, Paul was saved later on in his life. And as he drew closer to the Lord, we know that he went away for three years to be taught. He learned contentment. It allowed him just a few verses later to say, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. We should not be listening to the world. We should not be listening to Satan. This should be an encouragement to us that contentment is achievable. No amount of money will give us contentment. You can wake up every single day just accumulating more and more and more or you can desire less and be satisfied with what God has given you. On Friday nights, I've done a couple of messages on the psalmist Asaph. I like the psalmist Asaph. See, he was the worship leader. You know, he was, whether it be Hayden or Naji, up here leading the whole congregation of Israel in worship. But when I see someone like Asaph and I see someone like Paul having to learn, having to go through trials, struggling through the Psalms, it's an encouragement to me because it's something that I don't know about you guys, but I would struggle with and I do struggle with it. And oftentimes, oftentimes Asaph, he always, always came back to the Lord. He always remembered the Lord. He quotes it a few times, Psalm 73, Psalm 77. It should be an encouragement to us. Contentment is achievable. So we've seen what we shouldn't do. And then, he, and then he tells us what we should do. Now, Paul alluded to this in Philippians, but it's very, very clear here. Why should I take this financial advice? Why should I believe the writer? What's the money back guarantee? For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You know, when you take a step back and you see that this is a command, this is a practical command to live the Christian life. But I mean, I don't know about you, but if someone said to me, listen, don't covet money, just be content with what you have, I'd be like, okay, thank you very much, brother. I appreciate that. That really helps me. Um, but no worries, I'll start tomorrow. It makes the next part of the verse that much more important. We see the word for, that's the Greek word, gar. It links the command. So much more than do what I say, we have the because and we have the why. So why can we do it? We have a promise. But before we get there, notice the Bible says, he hath said it. Now, if one of you came up to me and you said, listen, don't worry, I got your back. Whatever you need to buy, I got it. I can cover you. I'd probably appreciate the words, but I would believe you as long as it didn't impact you or you'd have to sacrifice. I mean, even if the Apostle Paul wrote me a letter, and he, I'd definitely listen, but I'd be like, hey man, no offense, but you're dead. You know, even if I was one of these Hebrews at the time and Paul's saying, don't cover, be content, I'd be like, it's, I mean, I'm reading it, Paul, you know, you're telling me, but I mean, you're not even here. I mean, you're in and out of prison. You're pretty unreliable. I mean, I need someone, I need someone that, you know, that's faithful. I need someone that's always there. I need someone that has my best interest in mind all the time. I need someone who can work all things together for good. I need someone that has all power and glory and dominion. I need someone that has demonstrated their love towards me. I need someone that will sacrifice for me. I need someone that is wiser than me. I need someone that is good, that is honest, that is right, that is just, that is holy. See what I'm saying? For he hath said, who is it? It's the Lord. The one that saved you is speaking. This for he hath said, it's a perfect verb, meaning it's said in the past, it's completed, it's done, it's guaranteed. There are, many, there are many references in the Bible where the Lord had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Most notably, Deuteronomy 31, uh, 31.6, just before Israel was about to enter into the promised land. 
The Lord makes his promise right throughout the Bible. Genesis 28, 15, Joshua 1, 5, 1 Chronicles 28, 20. The list goes on and on and on. Christ himself says it. Do you realise that the one who has redeemed you, the one that has saved you, the one that has given you eternal life, the one that has adopted you, the one that has justified you, the one that has sanctified you, the one that has made you an heir, the one that will cause you to sit in heavenly places, the one that shed his innocent blood because of your sin, the one that was hung upon a tree, the one that was wounded for your transgression, bruised for your iniquity, who endured the wrath of God, the one who died was buried and was raised again. He is the one that sits at the right hand of God, advocating for you. He's the one that said it. We should listen. We should believe. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Read or listen, or listen to any commentary on this verse, and they will tell you that there are five negatives found in this verse. And in the English, I know it sounds bad, but in the Greek, it's actually wonderful. It's as if he's saying, I will know never, not even, no, never, leave you, nor forsake you. A five-fold guarantee. It will not happen. He will not leave you alone. And yet the one, uh, and yet we see here, the word leave is the word abandon. The word forsake is the word left behind. You'd be familiar with the word forsake. It was used on the cross when, when Christ said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I've said it once and I'll say it again. It blows my mind to, the think, to think that the one that was forsaken will never leave us nor forsake us. You see, he's talking to Christians, born again believers. I trust that's you tonight. You know, and in any opportunity that I'll get up here, I'd have to preach this message. If it's not you, if you have not yet put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't believe in the one that said, I am the resurrection and the life, in the one that said, I am the way, the truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, then you need to decide tonight, are you a sinner? The answer is yes then you need to ask yourself, well, what does it matter that I'm a sinner? Well, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's an eternal death in the lake of fire, hell. Then you need to ask yourself, well, well then I need, I need a saviour. And I'd say, yes, you do. So I tell you, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you might say, why? Why? Because you get up there with a tie and preach this message? No, because he said it. Christ said it. It's got nothing to do with me. And to the Christian here tonight, the Lord is saying, hey, I've got you. Don't cover money. Don't stress over your finances. Money will make themselves like wings and fly away. Money will not satisfy you. Money will abandon you. But he won't. And he promised it. So let's not be covered. Let's be content. Turn with me a few verses as we look to some encouragement tonight. Romans chapter 8 to start with. Romans chapter 8 verses 31 and 32. What shall we... What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And in my quiet time this morning, Matthew chapter 6, 25 to 34. We know these verses. We know the Sermon on the Mount. But we need to be encouraged here this evening. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what, shall, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? 
Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for the raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say to you, that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or withal shall we be clothed? For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have, in, ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Chances are that everyone here has a story about a time where the Lord was with them, where they just knew that the Lord was with them. I mean, they felt his presence. And there, be, there may be even some here tonight that are possibly looking for a sign, that are possibly looking for a miracle. Chances are you probably won't get it because we're called to walk by faith. The more you look at this world, you're going to see the wicked prospering. You're going to see people's bank, bank accounts growing and decreasing. The more you look to the insurances of mammon and this world, the more miserable and discontent you will be. I mean, the world is a sinking ship. Does it not seem foolish to put your trust in it? You may be going through a hard time, but the answer, the answer is not found here. It's found here. It's found in the Word of God. You can always, always, always trust it. You know, I spoke about Asaph before. You see, he was a Levite. You know, when they, when they were handing out lots and lands, the Levites didn't get any money. I mean, they didn't get any land. They didn't get any possessions. You know why? Because the Lord was their possession. And he's ours too. Just a quick story before, before I finish. You know, I, I heard this story, and it's, I don't know the people, but I just heard it, but I thought it was quite relevant for tonight. There was a grandmother. There was a grandmother who was sitting on her deathbed. The doctors had told her that she doesn't have that long to live. And the family's, you know, coming around, they're saying their goodbyes, they're trying to encourage her. And one of the nieces had said to her, Grandmother, do you feel, do you feel the presence of the Lord? And she said, no, I don't. But he said, he will never leave me nor forsake me, and I believe him. That's the attitude that we should have, no matter what circumstances we go through. We see an encouragement here not to cover, to be content with the things that we have. Why? Because of him. Because he said it. We just need to walk by faith. We don't need to wait till our deathbed. This promise, it's for now. It's already done. If you can identify the covetousness in your life, as I've had to do with mine, do what you've done many a times. Repent. Put your faith in the Lord and walk by it. Let's pray. Loving Father, our Lord and our God, oh Lord, you're so good to us. You promised to never leave us nor forsake us, Lord, even though you were forsaken on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that we can have victory through you. We thank you, Lord, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And we thank you, Lord, that we can take you at your word. I pray, Father, for your blessing upon this evening, Lord, the fellowship that we're about to have your leading and your guidance in all our lives. I pray, Father, that we may not you know, take the cares of this world, but that we would seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness and then just rest in you. I pray these things in Christ's most precious name. Amen. Thank you, brother.